everyone. It's kind of weird not to do tithes and offering before start preaching. <laughs> it's just uh, such a change of routine. Uh, so today we're just going to be continuing our last message on the, the series, Unshakable Faithfulness. And so before we start, I just want to open up in prayer. I'm short, so the mic needs to go down a little. Is it good? Okay. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for your presence this morning as we collectively worship together, Lord, those online and those here with us, Lord. It is such a, a rejoicing moment, Lord. And Lord, I just want to pray, God, just to, for you to have your way, Lord. It is your word. It is, God, just uh, it, is, it is about you, Lord. So I ask you, Jesus, you would speak personally to each and every one listening online and those here in this present moment, Lord. And and I ask, oh God, that you would take over, Lord Jesus, and that you would be glorified and honored today, in Jesus' name, amen. So the uh, last message in, the, in our series, I entitled it, A Shield in Battle. So over the past few months, I'm sure, and m many months to come, I'm sure, we have been fighting against this virus's ability to take over. It seems that now that we are back in the yellow phase, it, it seems like we've won a little bit of a victory. And so that feels really good. We've discovered that there are strategies that shield us from, uh, sorry, we have discovered strategies that shield us in some measures against the virus. So as many of you guys are this morning, are, are wearing masks. We do the two meters, we stand two meters apart and we wash our hands and we use a lot of sanitizer. I'm surprised my hands are in this good condition with all the hand sanitizer that I've been using. But so these are the strategies that we have, uh, that we have used against uh, a physical invisible enemy. But how do we fight our invisible spiritual enemy? And so I want to read a scripture in 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. And so 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the whole world. And I feel like it's kind of an appropriate verse because we're all experiencing, all over the world, we're experiencing this pandemic. We're experiencing this, this suffering. And so do you know that you're in a battle? That it isn't just, you know, there's times we enter conflicts and difficulties in life, but it isn't just the, the, the battles that are concerning this world. There's a spiritual battle. There's a battle for our souls each and every, every day. And uh, so I was listening to this uh, yesterday to this uh, video by Joni Erickson Tata. For those who don't know, Jer Joni Erickson Tata is this woman who's a, a paraplegic and she lost the use of her legs and she's just wonderfully married to this man uh, named Ken. And they were just sharing their experience uh, about how they dealt with this whole thing with the pandemic because at this point he became the sole caregiver for her. She usually has a team of people helping her to take care of her, you know, with her makeup, her hair, and different things because she doesn't have the use of her arms fully to the, her, her full capacity. And so they found that through this time, it kind of brought things to the surface. I don't know about you guys, but during this pandemic, this isolation, it does bring things to the surface, especially when our privileges are being taken away, especially when we are facing difficulties. It brings to the surface a lot of uglies. And so she recalls rolling over his foot with her wheelchair. <laughs> and she says there were, and they both, I love it because they both give that little testimony together. And they say, you know, together, it says there were short fuses, hurt feelings, Sharp words and cold shoulders were kind of an everyday thing in the beginning. And they say, we quickly realized that if we were going to survive this pandemic, especially emotionally, and if their marriage was going to survive, they said we needed to get a grip of what God wanted of us during this season. And so sometimes understanding, you know, what God wants of us in this, it can be that shield to preserve and protect us from consequences of our decisions. 
So God's word actually became their greatest tool in overcoming all the, the difficulties. Instead of fighting each other, they started fighting with the word of God. And that became their anchor through this, this time. And it, it wasn't always easy, but they did have victory. And during the, actually the beginning of the pandemic, she came out with a, a devotional, a new version, the Bible app, called Shel in Sh uh, Sheltering Together, or Sheltering Place. And it was so encouraging. This woman who, you know, you would think, like, she's going through her own difficulties, but was able to encourage me. It encouraged my faith greatly because I feel if she can get through this, I can get through this as well. And so the Word of God is our greatest offense tool, actually, because the Bible says that the Word of God is a double-edged sword. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is there to attack. But may I suggest that God's faithfulness and his goodness can be a shield to you in the battles that we fight. And there's going to be battles every day, pandemic or no pandemic, there are battles every day. Psalm 28 verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. It isn't just that the word, his word is our shield. No, God is our shield. It's, he, he goes on to say, he says, My heart trusted in him and I am helped therefore my heart will greatly rejoice and with my song I will praise him the psalmist re recognized that God was his strength and was his shield and as he put his trust in him he found the help that he so longed for and he started depending on God's faithfulness that's where he put his hope a minute ago, I just read you the scripture, you know, in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. And it talks about resisting the, the, the devil. And it talks about being vigilant, sober, because the enemy wants to destroy. And what I love about the word of God is that nothing is put there by coincidence. There is always a context. And if you look at the context of which the scripture is put into, Peter is writing to a church who is going through persecution. I mean, Yes, our pandemic has been difficult, but on a long haul, we haven't been mauled by lions or, you know, tortured or whipped or beaten. Uh, but that's what they were going through at that very moment. They were being persecuted by the Roman Empire as believers. And so Peter writes this, these verses to encourage him. And he says, I want you guys to be aware of what the enemy's strategy is. I want you to be aware that the enemy has a strategy for you and for your soul. He wants to bring destruction to you. But resist him, st steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering. So he's telling them, you're, you're not alone in this. And so if you look at the verses that precede this, in verse 5, so if you're in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And here's the crooks of it. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And here's the key verse, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Peter knew that one of the greatest strategies of the enemy, one of the greatest lies that the enemy will use is that God doesn't care about your situation. And he will have you look upon your circumstances and your relationships and your struggles and your battles with that perspective. If he has you with that perspective, he's already won. And so Peter is encouraging, be sober. I want you to be aware of what the enemy's doing. I want you to be aware that the one lie that you're experiencing in your suffering and your struggle in the, in the, in the persecution that, and the fear that you must be living because, you know, like you could die at any moment because they were being attacked was that I want you to understand that God cares for you. I don't want you to believe the lie of the enemy, that God isn't under control, that he isn't powerful enough, and that he doesn't care about you. So, how do we stay sober and vigilant against the enemy's plan? In trusting God's character, his unshakable faithfulness towards you. So, Satan seeks whom he may devour. So, what does he work the hardest to devour in you? Your ability to trust God's character and get he, what his strategy is. He's like, if I can get them to trust in their own selves, I've got it good. And so the enemy wants you to 
take away your trust from God and to put it on yourself. And actually, you know, that's kind of like our normal instincts is to put our trust in ourselves. And if you look at the parable of the sower with the four fields, I'm not going to go through the whole parable, but one of the soils where the plant dies off quickly is the one surrounded and choked by the cares of this world. In Mark 4, 19, it says, Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. So it's not that they haven't heard the word. They've heard the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And so what we get for head knowledge about God gets choked up by our concerns and our cares. What weighs heavy on our hearts, whether it's through our circumstances, through our difficulties in our relationships, the uncertainty of tomorrow, the anxiety is about our, even our own worth. These can become preoccupied, and it dulls the heart at one point and creates this sense of apathy. So what does the enemy want to happen to us? He wants us to become unfruitful for the kingdom of God, and that is one sure way to do it. And that's exactly what happens. When I'm so preoccupied by the things that I fear the most or the things that I am so outraged about, then I'm no longer focusing on the kingdom of God. I'm no longer focusing on others, loving on others, being available for what the Holy Spirit could lead me potentially in. I become just involved with myself. And this is why Peter exhorts the people who are going through all of this persecution to cast their cares upon God, but to submit to God. Humility is saying that your opinion matters more than my, than my own. And that's why God resists the proud, because you're going, through, you're going with your own way. But he gives grace to the humble. Those who say, God, you know what, I don't know what I should be doing with this situation. I don't know how to respond. God gives grace to that. He says, oh, I'll, I'm going to come and give you help. If you say, no, no, I know how to take care of this. No, I'll take care of this myself. Then God, you're, you're basically cutting off your very resource for help. And so God, he says, uh, so he, to submit to God's plan for them in the midst because God cares for them. He says, in essence, what he's saying, he says, I want you to know three things. In that scripture, when you look at the scripture, he's saying three things. He wants, he's saying, you know, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. God is mighty. So he's saying God is powerful, number one. And he's talking about how those very same persecutions your brothers around the world are experiencing. So number two, you're not alone in all of this. That's one of the lies the enemy will want to use is, oh, you're the only one going through this. And you, you know, don't involve other people with you. Well, of course, we'll become discouraged when we think that we're the only ones and when we're trying to go through this alone. And number three, God cares for you. That then becomes a starting point for their response. And that becomes a starting point. If those three things, God is mighty, you're not alone, and God cares for you, that becomes the starting point for our response. Pastor Mona uh, two weeks ago talked about crisis demands a response. But we need to respond from the, first, from the right perspective, the right point of view. I just, if you can put the next slide on. And this is something that God has been showing me through this, this season. One of the things that we try to control, that we, you know, when we're not letting God take care of us, or we're not, we, there's two options. You can take care of your own outcome, try to control your own outcome. That's you taking care of your own cares, taking under control your own cares. Or you can surrender the outcome. See, God still asks us to respond and to walk responsibly. But what he does want us to surrender to him, to cast upon him, is the outcome. We don't, it's, it's ridiculous to think that we'd have control over the outcome. We don't. But... We spend a lot of energy thinking about the outcome or trying to control the outcome. And so in this season of my life, you know, I've been on sick leave since December and, you know, like 
I was like, I was so in a hurry to get back to work, like, because I'm, you know, like, I just want to be productive, you know. But in this season of time, God was asking me to rest. He was asking me to, to be still, and I found that very, very difficult. I needed to, to agree with God that he knew better than I did. He knew better what I needed than I, than I thought. But in the midst of that, you know, I got, I got, I mean, restored my body. I'm feeling better. But now, like, I want to get back to work. So in this pandemic, talk about a time. I, I decided to take a non-paid leave. And I figured, I'll do substitute teaching. You know, like, it'll be easy. And then the pandemic happens. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you got to be kidding me. Like, how, what kind of income am I going to get? I was panicking. But then I realized that God, I brought back to that first point, wait, God cares for me. So I need, that needed to be my baseline to where I decide to respond to my situation. And so God is good. He provided with, uh, with uh, CERB. So I was able to have uh, some EI during that time. And then I was like, okay, well, I need to get a job. Like, cause I, uh, I gave my resignation for my teaching position, uh, you know, and it's, it was in effect on the 23rd of June. And I'm like, I need a job. Like I need to get back to work. But in that season, God, you know, I was still doing what I needed to do, which means that I needed to be responsible, apply for work, but leave the outcome to God. And every time that I was tempted to, to, you know, be concerned and consumed, I would go back to the fact, wait a minute, God cares for me. He has everything under control. I can't control anything about this, but I can just trust him. Have I done what I was supposed to do? Yes. All right. I've done my part. Now I just need to leave the rest to God. And I was obedient to what he was asking. Fretting, actually, or trying to control the situation would have communicated that I did not trust him. It would just have exposed that very fact. But God, it was so gracious that so I have a job now. <laughs> but it was all in his timing. He was never late. He was just on time. So I needed, and that shield, it, his, his goodness, his faithfulness was a shield for my heart in that time. When I depended on his faithfulness and his goodness and knowing that I could cast my cares on him because he cares for me, then that became a shield for my heart from worry, from stress, from irritation. And it really enabled me to look outwards and to serve and to be available for the kingdom. See, the enemy wants us to keep the outcome and to mull over that inside of our hearts. But when we give it to control, we give it into his capable hands. And so we give the outcome, and it, then it frees our hearts to be focused on his kingdom. It frees our hearts to be fully present in the moment, to really actually delight in the people that are around him, to delight in God's presence so much more because we're not consumed <clears throat> by the fear of the outcome of what could, could be or possibly not be. And so God is not asking us to be inactive in our dependence upon him. He is asking us to act in obedience to him and to seek him diligently. So there are two starting points. I have, the, I have a little race. Uh, next slide. Yeah, all right. I like illustrations. <laughs> so there are two starting points. You know, there's... You either start from the get-go on God's faithfulness and follow his instruction and his, and his uh, guiding, and that leads us to God's will for your life. I mean, it's a straight line, but it doesn't mean that that straight line is going to be easy. But it does mean that we stay focused and unmoved. Or, you can go to the next one, we can see life and our struggles through our fear, anxiety, our need for control. And as you can see, this line is kind of going all over the map. And that's what happens with us. When we're fearful, when we're depending on our, our sense of control, we're all over the map. We're not consistent. And we're moved up and down and all around. And we forfeit the, 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 the fullness of what God could have for us. Sometimes, especially in our relationships, when someone offends us, we want to, well, I don't know. There's two types of people. I'm a flight person. I will ignore, put my head in the sand. You know, that's my tendency. But you have people who are in fight mode. So they will respond to that person, you know, right away. And then they miss out on the blessing that that moment could be and that relationship could be. 
You know, it says a wise woman builds up, builds her house, a, a foolish woman tears down her house. Well, I think that can apply for everyone. In Proverbs it says. And so even in flight, you can, I can avoid a situation you know, well, that person did something. I'm not going to, I'm just not going to talk to her about it. I'm just going to pretend nothing happened. But also, that's, it brings to the very same outcome. Is a missed opportunity in experiencing God's fullness for your life and his best. So trusting in God shields us from decisions we might make that seriously and negatively impact our lives. And sometimes those decisions involve inactivity and will bring us unnecessary consequences to our life. So it takes courage. It is no small thing. It takes courage to let go of our, our innate responses, whether it's fight or flight or paralyze, whatever, and to put our trust in God. I like Romans chapter 8, verse 37. He says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors, and gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us. That's the baseline. We have victory through him who loved us. That's your starting point. Did you know that before the battle even begins that you already have the victory? We may have to walk through some difficulties and stand strong in the faith, but we know the ending of the story when you put your trust in God. So God's word helps us fight but it is also a shield against Satan's lies. And I just want to enumerate a few of the lies that the enemy can use, but there's so many of them. He likes to, he's the father of lies, so he has a few in his arsenal. One of the lies that we might be dealing with is, I'm alone in this. That could be your starting point, your starting line. It's my mess, so I should be the one to fix it. That could be your starting line for your response. This will end badly, so i got to you know, figure something. That could be your starting line. Things will never change. I will never change. I will be rejected. I need, something to do, I need to do something now. Those can be starting points from which you make a decision to respond to your situation. But when you go, but that, you know, those starting points bring their own sets of consequences. When we start... With God is faithful, God cares about me. Okay, God, what is it that you want me to do in this situation? You wait upon him. You wait for his leading. Then you get to experience his goodness. If we look in the story of in Exodus 14, so Exodus chapter 14, it's the story of the Israelites when they're leaving Egypt. And the people had to put their trust in God, actually, to leave Egypt, you know. Egypt was a terrible taskmaster, and yet, they needed a lot of convincing to let go and trust God. It needed to get really serious before they decide to leave this country of, of captivity, this place of captivity, and to put their trust in God. In Exodus 14, 14, it says, The Lord will fight for you while you only need to keep silent and remain calm. And so... The people of Israel, this is the scripture that God gave them when they were at the, the Red Sea. They're about to cross over. And so they had their leader, Moses. Moses was their leader. Moses trusted in God. And you know, as leaders, we can have such an impact on those following us in the example that we leave behind and what, on, on how to trust God. I mean, Moses had a lot of people who had to follow him. And he needed to trust in his, in his God. And when he put his stick in the water and saw God part the sea, he, he led them there, not knowing, because he didn't know where God was going to lead them, but see, Moses trusted in the faithfulness and goodness of God. And once they got there, they were freaking out. But Moses trusted in God. It didn't mean that, you know, because in that scripture it says uh, that the Lord will fight for you. You only need to keep silent and remain calm. It didn't mean that they didn't actually have to cross themselves. They had to cross. They still had something to do. And part, actually, of the package of victory, often there's a step of obedience that comes with it. It's not inactivity. Saying that, oh, well, God will fight for me. No, there's still something in the process that God is asking you to do. Oops. 
And one of the half, that's one of the half truths of the enemy sometimes that he uses to dupe us all is all I need to do is pray and God will do everything. Oh God, I just pray you touch this person who's really, you know, nasty with me. God, you just do the, you, you just do the work. Or I, I could have at home, I could have like prayed, Lord, please give me a job. And if I hadn't applied for work, how foolish would that have been? Like, okay, just rain a job, you know, a job from heaven. Just open the windows of heaven, Lord. You know, like, no. I needed to be obedient in trusting God. The baseline was trusting God. God, I'm going to apply, and whatever that you have planned for me, you will open up those doors. I will do what it's my responsibility to do. When we have conflict with other people, you can't just kind of like, okay, Lord, I just, you know, pray that you fix this whole situation. And But if you're still responding negatively to that person, then, you know, like, God's like, oh, well, I've given you commands in order for this to be fixed, but you got your part to do as well. And so, but those experiences actually help to grow our trust in God. But whenever you go from that half-truth, I just need to, st- to sit back and let God do all the work, that actually creates, often uh, has a ne- negative impact on your faith. Because you see God as an ATM machine. And when the ATM machine is not giving you, you know, what you asked for in the package that you wanted, then you become disappointed and disillusioned and bitter often. And that's, kind of, that's not relationship with God. That's just uh, a, uh, an ex- a business exchange. But God isn't like that. He is very concerned about your character. He's very concerned about your relationships. And he wants to make your life fruitful. So how do we fight off this half-truth uh, and these, how do we fight off the, strategy, the strategies of the enemy? This strategy of the enemy is to get us to focus on try to take control over a situation or to uh, not in, just not put our care in God's hands. Well, it is by understanding who God is. And how do we understand who God is? It is by renewing our minds with God's word. Romans 12, ch- uh, chapter 12, verses 2 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I like the second part. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Why? Because you will know him in a greater measure. And his good and pleasing and perfect will. See, God has a good and pleasing and perfect will. That's the outcome that he desires. But when we take under control, we're saying, God, I am not interested in... In, your, in what you have to offer. I'm not interested in your plan. I'm interested in my plan. And I'm not interested in your kingdom, God. I'm interested in my own kingdom. And we fight for our own kingdom. And the Bible says that those who try to, to save their lives will lose it. Those who give their lives away will gain it. One of the scriptures that helped me shift my focus and helped me to focus on God's goodness and his character, that baseline that I needed to start every day with, was that scripture in 2 Peter 3, 9. says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that anyone should perish. So every time I'm like, well, God, I haven't had a job yet. Like, I didn't get any news yet. Like, maybe I should call. Like, and then God would bring me back that scripture. You know what, Erica? I'm not last minute. I'm not, I'm not too late. I might be like really last minute concerned in your perspective, but I have everything with a perfect time. You need to trust me. And so in, even with, uh, even my sister and I are moving this weekend and we were looking for an apartment and I called my landlord asking for an apartment, see if he had any, uh, anything available. And he says, well, maybe, you know, maybe not. And so I just left it in God's hands. And cause we were looking around, we couldn't seem to find anything. And God provided in such a supernatural way, you know, like, I mean, actually they had another lady gave my sister the landlord's phone number to call him. And it was just like, it's amazing how God provided above and beyond what we were asking for. But we needed to trust him. We needed to trust the outcome of finding an apartment, the outcome of finding a job, the outcome in the broken relationship that seems to be so distant to you. Those people in your life that you feel like you can't reach anymore or that they've been so disconnected for those broken relationships. I want to encourage you to entrust those relationships, the outcomes of those relationships into God's hands. The outcome of your finances. You know, again, 
we have our part to do. You know, if you're saying, God, you know, help me with my finances and you're buying McDonald's every day, <laughs> like, <laughs> that doesn't go together very well. But I want to encourage you to trust in him. So this scripture actually shielded my heart from unnecessary worry and fret. It sh shielded me from taking matters into my own hands. It shielded me from not waiting for God's best for me. It also shielded me from ignoring others that are around me. It helped me to stay focused on God's kingdom. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In Matthew and so God cares about your needs. But he is asking you to entrust. That means that you entrust his sovereignty, his control, rather than yours. I want to finish off with the, this verse in Psalm 1830. And I don't know if you can see it here, but it says, God's way is perfect and the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? And so I just want to encourage you today just to take a moment just to bring your cares before him because he cares for you. He cares about those relationships. He cares about those circumstances but he also cares about his relationship to you. And he wants you to experience your relationship with him in a greater and deeper measure than ever before. And what comes out of that is a peace that goes beyond all understanding, a joy that is unexplainable, and just the reaping the benefits of God's blessing in your life, in your relationships and others. So I just, I hope this touched your heart. I hope that, that God brought conviction to your heart in areas where it is unsurrendered because God wants the best for you. And he wants your heart to be available to his invitation to touch the people's lives around you. So let me just finish up in prayer today. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you, oh God, for the blessing that it is to come to your house, Lord. As the, the scripture says, I was glad, very glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And Lord, I, I just want to pray for the people here. Lord, I pray protection, Lord, continued protection, Lord Jesus. But I pray, Lord, for a, a greater trust in you, Lord a greater uh, a dependence upon you, a greater obedience to your word because you have their best at heart. And Lord, I, I pray that you would protect uh, the, just the people in our community, Lord God, against this COVID thing, Lord. And, and I pray that as doors are beginning to open, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would protect this area, Lord. And that with our grand opening next week, Lord, may it be a joyous occasion, a time of rejoicing, a time of blessing, Lord, and I just pray your blessing over your people today. In Jesus' name.